Welcome Sunday School teachers and Bible study leaders to our overview of LifeWay's Explore the Bible lesson of John chapter 3 verses 4 through 18 for Sunday, January 1st with the title, Everybody Who Believes. I know a lot of churches are not having Sunday School on Sunday, January 1st as it's New Year's Day, but if you are, uh, you're on here because you want some help with it. So I hope I have a little something that'll be of, uh, of assistance to you as you do the lesson for this Sunday. One way you might begin this week would be uh, with the, the famous uh, Charles Dickens classic story, A Christmas Carol. Uh, some of you may have seen it. Some of your class members may have seen it this Christmas season. Of course, the story opens with Ebenezer Scrooge being mean to his clerk, Bob Cratchit. He turns down an opportunity to give it a charity. He yells humbug at his nephew, invites him over for Christmas. But as many of you know, by the end of the story, he really changed. He sends over a huge turkey to the Cratchits. He gives to charity. He goes to see his nephew for Christmas. Scrooge had a big turnaround, a big change. So you could follow that up then with a question, or you may not even use the Scrooge story, but just open up your class with the question. It'd be an, an alternate way to do it. Just ask the question, have you ever known somebody who really changed? For example, I had a friend in high school who'd been very overweight all the years that we knew her. One year she showed up at school the first day of class after summer break, had lost an a, a incredible amount of weight. Everybody's jaws just opened when she walked into the, the, the student lounge. We'd never seen anybody change so much. You can talk about, your group can talk about people they know who have changed, not only physically, but especially spiritually over the years. And, uh, and you can say, you know, the same thing can happen spiritually. God can change people through the power of his Holy Spirit. And in today's lesson, Jesus talks about that kind of change. He uses the famous phrase, born again, and he talks about how that can happen to us by putting our faith in him. Well, the context, of course, for this week's passage is uh, we're continuing our study in the book of John. We saw in chapter one how Jesus is the God-man who came to be the, the Lamb of God who would die for our sins. And he calls his first disciples to follow him. In chapter two, he turns the water into wine, the first of seven miracles that form the backbone of John chapters one through 11. Then Jesus cleanses the temple from the people who are taking advantage of others there, which brings us to our present passage, John chapter three. Verses one through three tell us that a Pharisee, Nicodemus, came to Jesus by night. Now, a couple things here. First, the background. It says he was a Pharisee. Let's not take for granted that everybody knows what that is. Pharisee, the word Pharisee is from the Aramaic language. Uh, the Jews spoke in Jesus' time, similar to Hebrew. It comes from a word that means to separate, to separate. So these men were separatists, separating themselves from other things so that they might remain holy. Well, you could see how that would lead to a person or a group becoming self-righteous, and that is what happened. Luke 18 tells a story of, the, of course, the Pharisee and, and the publican in the temple, and the, it says the Pharisee prayed to himself, I thank God that I'm not like this other man. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all I get. He was very self-righteous, and Jesus went on to say that man did not go back to his house justified. That was typical of the Pharisees. In fact, Jesus' strongest words in all the New Testament were for the self-righteous Pharisees. He called them sons of hell. Now, do we need to guard against that same spirit today? Absolutely. Nothing turns people off more than a holier-than-thou spirit, and nothing will shut us off from God's grace quicker than spiritual pride. It's the humble to whom God gives grace in, in his kingdom. But on the other hand, because of that, we tend to think of Pharisees as being bad, and many of them were, but Nicodemus could see something. He could see Jesus was from God, so he came to Jesus to talk. This was good. So we need to be careful about lumping people together in groups and condemning them all. Not all Pharisees were bad or closed-minded to Jesus. Nicodemus came to him. So you might ask your class by way of application, what other groups might we be tempted to lump together and, and think they're all bad? Uh, some of your class members may suggest people of other races, people of other ethnic groups, people of other political parties, maybe young people who dress differently or old people who dress differently or people who have tattoos or people of other denominations or, or whatever. It's easy for us to, to lump people together in, in other groups. And Nicodemus reminds us here that uh, sometimes God may be working in some of those people. So let, let us not write them off. And so this uh, Pharisee, Nicodemus, came to Jesus, began to tell him that uh, he had come from, he knew he'd come from God as a teacher. Jesus interrupted him with those famous words in verse three, 
Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, the phrase born again is literally born from above. Basically, Jesus was saying, Nicodemus, you need what only God can do for you. Stop your own self-righteous work. You need to be born from above. You need to be, to be born spiritually. You need to be born again. And Nicodemus' problem is the problem that many people have. They're seeking the best that they can do with their own reason, with their own works, with their own uh, religious deeds. But we need more than that. We need what only God can do. It's like the rich young ruler in, in Matthew uh, 19. He, he wanted to do the best he could by keeping the commandments. Jesus tried to expose that. So listen, that, that's not enough uh, for you to do those things. You've got to be born again. A great example of that uh, from history, an example you might use is Charles Wesley, author of the famous Christmas carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, that so many of us uh, use this Christmas season. When Charles was a young college student at Oxford, England, he and a number of friends were very religious. They formed a, a club called the Holy Club. Uh, they uh, covenanted uh, to live disciplined Christian lives and study the Bible and pray and fast, do charitable works, a very religious group. But uh, when he went to Georgia, United States, on a mission trip, he got sick, and a Moravian missionary who was there asked him if he knew for sure that Jesus was his Savior. And Wesley said, well, I hope so. And then he talked about all the good works that he was doing, but he didn't really know, and, and that troubled him. And uh, But it got him turning his heart towards God. And then back in England on Whit Sunday, May 21st, 1738, he had a real personal experience with God. He wrote in his journal, the Spirit of God chased away the darkness of my unbelief, and he was saved. And Wesley wrote the classic hymn, And Can It Be, or otherwise known as Amazing Love, How Can It Be, uh, in response to his salvation. Verse 3 of the song tells his testimony. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? See, Charles Wesley's story is that of a man who tried his best with all his good religious works, his holy club, and all of that, but it wasn't enough. Like Nicodemus, he needed to be born from above. He needed to be born again, and finally he was, and then his life was changed. You, can, you might share Wesley's testimony or maybe another testimony like that, maybe your own and say, this is what has to happen to each one of us. You must be born again. Listen, there, there may be some people in your class right now in the same spot as Nicodemus and, and Charles Wesley were. They're trying their best, but it's not enough. They need what only God can do. So th this is a, a great opportunity to share the gospel in your class this Sunday. And you may have somebody in your group this week who needs to be born again. Ask God to do what only he can do in your class and in their life this week. In, in touching their hearts. And as another application, you might ask your group, do you know somebody, a family member, friend, or some other loved one who needs the change that only God can bring in their life? Let your group share some of these. And then you might have a prayer time and ask God, Lord, do what only you can do in these lives. Touch them with your power from above that they might be born again. Well, so Jesus was talking with Nicodemus about all this. And in verse 9, Nicodemus is amazed. He asked Jesus how this can be. Jesus is amazed. Nicodemus can be the teacher of Israel and not know all this. He goes on to say a couple of very important things I would focus on this week. One's found in verse 14 and one, of course, in verse 16. In verse 14, he mentions the serpent in the wilderness. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. Well, that sounds like an odd thing, doesn't it? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, what was that talking about? What's well, the story from Numbers 21 in the Old Testament? The people of Israel were complaining against God and Moses again. And verse 6 says, The Lord sent fiery serpents that bit the people, and they died. So the people came to Moses and repented. And they said, We've sinned. Intercede with God that he might take away these serpents. So Moses did pray, and, and God told him to do the oddest thing. He said, make a bronze replica of one of those serpents, put it on a wooden pole, and whoever's bitten by one of those poisonous snakes, if they look at that serpent on the pole, they will live. So Moses did that. He put it on a pole, 
And it came about if the serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. Well, that's, that's kind of an odd story, you might say, until you come here to John 3, where Nicodemus comes to Jesus and wants eternal life, and Jesus says, you've got to be born again. And he says, here's how it happens. And he quotes Numbers 21. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Now, all of a sudden, that crazy story in Numbers makes sense, doesn't it? God in the Old Testament is giving us the ABCs to help us understand salvation when it comes. God is showing us in that story in Numbers 21 that we've all been bitten by the biggest problem we have, our sin. And there's no cure we can come up with for ourselves. We have to look to God's answer by faith at the salvation he raised up in the air for us to see. Jesus on the wooden pole. Jesus on the cross. And what did the Israelites have to do to get cured from those serpents? They didn't really have to do anything. They didn't have to offer any sacrifices or bring any money or do any good deeds. All they had to do was believe enough to look at what God raised up on the pole. Whoever believed enough to look and trust that it would save them was cured and saved. So Jesus told Nicodemus, that's how you're saved today too. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. In other words, what do you have to do to be saved? Not get baptized, not give money, not do some great deed. No, whoever believes, just like the serpent was lifted up, so Jesus was lifted up on the cross. And whoever looks to him, believing he will save them, will be saved. No works, no deeds, nothing. Jesus saves and Jesus alone. An illustration you might use uh, is that of Charles Spurgeon. Many know his name, but perhaps the greatest preacher who ever lived. Spurgeon was saved as a young man when he was had been burdened by his sin for some time, and he was out looking for a church service in a snowstorm. He stumbled into a primitive Methodist church where an untrained layman was preaching on the book of Isaiah, where it says, Look to me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. That uh, preacher told Spurgeon, Young man, you look miserable. And he exhorted him, look to Jesus. Just look, look to Jesus. Put your trust in him and look to him. And by God's grace, it suddenly all made sense to Spurgeon and he was saved that day when he looked to Jesus. That's what that great verse 14 is all about. Look to Jesus. Put your faith in him who was raised up on the cross. That's how you're saved. One of the great, great examples in scripture. Then, of course, we come to verse 16, perhaps the greatest verse in all the Bible. Uh, one option for Sunday, honestly, would be just teach John 3, 16. Just teach that one verse. That There's so much there. I just preached a, a message on John 3, 16 not long ago that I entitled uh, the greatest verse, and I made the following points about it. You can use them if you want to. I said it might be the greatest verse because, number one, it has the greatest motivation for God so loved. Well, why did God do all that he did for us? It's love. He loved us. In C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters, the demon screw tape tells his apprentice demon Wormwood, one must face the fact that all the talk about his love for men is not, as one would gladly believe, mere propaganda, but an appalling truth. He really does love them. Screw tape says in another place, he really does love the filthy creatures. <laughs> that demon had it right. God really does love us despite all we've done. God so loved. He did it for love. Secondly, it may be the greatest verse because of, it tells us of the greatest sacrifice. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, giving Jesus to die on the cross for us so that we might be saved. An illustration you could use right after the infamous 1938 Munich Agreement, which British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain attempted to appease Hitler by giving him parts of Czechoslovakia. Uh, of course, it didn't work. It didn't stave off World War II. It only postponed it. But when that happened, Guy Burgess of the BBC interviewed Winston Churchill, who was then a member of the British Parliament. Churchill told him that the Czechoslovakian president had asked him for help. Churchill told Burgess, what answer shall I give? Uh, he said, what assistance can I proffer? Uh, Burgess uh, could think of nothing to say. Then Churchill spoke. He said, you're silent, Mr. Burgess. You're rightly silent. What, what else can I offer? Only one thing. My only son, Randolph, who is already training to be an officer in the British 
Armed Services. It comes from William Manchester's book, The Last Lion, pages 365 and 366. Churchill was going to send his own son into the military to fight the Nazis. That's what God did out of his love for us. He made the greatest sacrifice, sending his son to earth to atone for our sins. It's also the greatest verse because it tells us of the greatest invitation. Whoever believes in him is open to anyone, whoever. That there's no one your class knows anywhere on the earth that this is not for. It's for whoever. It's the greatest invitation. And it's also the greatest invitation because it asks so little for what we get. Just believe. Of course, believe doesn't just mean believe in your mind there was a person named Jesus. It means much more than that. Zha Yan Qin was a female Chinese student who came to the University of Oklahoma several years ago to study. While she was there, she was invited by a friend to come to a Chinese Bible study at Trinity Baptist Church where Cheryl and Michael and I attended while I was sick for a couple of years. She began to study the Bible with several tutors from the church, and through that study, she learned that God loved her, but that she had sinned against God and that Jesus had died on the cross to, to pay for her sins. She knew, she learned all these facts, but one thing still remained. She had to respond. She had to believe in Jesus to be saved. But what did that mean? Here's what she later wrote in her testimony. I suddenly remembered Bill, the leader of the, the Chinese ministry, lecturing on faith. He said, faith is not that I point to an airplane and say to the other people, I think the plane is safe. Faith is that I have to get on the plane and prove it is safe. I, and she went on to say, I believe Jesus is that plane. I am willing to put my faith in him and trust the fact that he died for our sin. What Zhao Yan Qin was talking about there is real saving faith, putting your trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior to be saved. And then it's the greatest verse because it teaches us of the greatest destination. We have eternal life, not just living forever. Uh, living forever wouldn't be that good if we just got older and older, but it's that we live forever with God in heaven with a pleasure and the joy that Psalm 1611 says God has waiting for us there. There's so much, of course, we can say about John 316. You can add to that. If you'd like to read the whole message I shared on that great verse, you can find it on my blog at www.seanethomas.com. Type John 316 in the search bar and you can pull up the text and get some more explanation, illustration, and application for John 316 that might help you this week. All right, well, I better wrap it up for today. I hope this helps you some if you've got the lesson for John 3 on New Year's Day. We're going to move on to John chapter 4 and the woman at the well for January 8th. Another, going to be another great lesson. Remember, if you'd like to, to read or print a text version of this overview, you can get that too on my blog at www.shawneethomas.com. I'll put that address in the comments below. If you'll hit subscribe to this video, YouTube will automatically send you next week's video and you won't have to search for it. And if you write something in the comments below, I'll be sure to pray for you and for your group by name this week. Per my licensing agreement with LifeWay, these weekly lessons are based on content from Explore the Bible Adult Resources. The presentation is my own and it has not been reviewed by LifeWay. LifeWay resources are available at GoExploreTheBible.com and uh, GoExploreTheBible.com slash adults dash training. If you have questions about Explore the Bible resources, you can send emails to ExploreTheBible at LifeWay.com.